Hello, my name is Carson Wolf. Today I'm going to talk about, I guess, the first four years of electronics. Because it's a bit sort of interesting that our human brain just forgets everything. Mine at least does. Things just disappear. So, although everything I'm going to talk about today, you should already know, I wanted to refresh it because it's necessary as we proceed into the course. So think of this as, well, sit back, relax, and expect that you probably already know everything here. <coughs> Let's see. Imagine that there are people that work their whole life on defining what the units are seconds, meter, kilograms, ampere, kelvin, mole, and candela. These are our base units. Everything else is derived from them. I kind of like this graph because it shows you how things are related. I don't need to remember what farad is or the equation for farad. You can actually see it from this graph. So. Did I start now? Yeah, I think I started. <laughs> right, so we can actually see cool things from the graph. Look at Farad. So Farad has a unit of Coulomb per volt. And Coulomb is, what's that? That's ampere seconds. I'm just writing on a notepad here. I'll show you afterwards. And volts, well, well, that's watt amperes, but we don't really need that. Okay. Show you something cool here. Okay, so this is our units, right? So if farads is given by the units coulomb per volt, that's equal to ampere seconds per volt. So if I now write my capacitance, well, that's also a C. <laughs> well, anyway, you understand the difference. C, capacitance. That must then be equal to, well, ampere is, that's current, and actually, no, let's not do current, let's do Let's do charge. So ampere second is charge, Q, and volt, well, that's just V. So that must mean that the charge, that's going to be given by the equation CV. But we can actually continue this. So since Q is ampere seconds, then this is going to be current times seconds equals capacitance times voltage. Now this is this is actually a differential equation. So the change, let's do it like this, I equals C D V change in voltage as a function of time. Well, it's seconds, I shouldn't use seconds, I should use time. I should use time there too. So I think it's kind of cool that from this image of all the units, you can sort of derive the, we can figure out the equations. I like that because I, I don't like going around remembering everything. It's just easier to understand how things are connected and then you can figure it out. So there are things like the standard units and you should know about this graph. Then, you should know by now, there are things called electrons, and they are part of the standard model of ele elementary particles. There are only, what is it, 13 particles? So this is 6, no, that's 6, that's 12, okay, so there's 12 particles with mass, and then you have the bosons, so there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 bosons. Uh, well, yeah, okay, so that's, was it 17? 12 plus 5? Yeah. Anyway, 
there are only 12 things that uh, that matter is made of, we think. And one of them is the electron. Now, all electrons are similar. All electrons are what's called fermions. So they have a spin of half. Bosons have a spin of one. Th there's a big difference between bosons and fermions because fermions cannot exist at the same, I think it's correct to say, space-time coordinates in the same quantum state. So if they're in the same physical space, and that's determined by the probability, or the, actually the amplitude of the, of the um, uh, wave function, we'll get to that. If they're in the same physical space, like the hydrogen atom, or even better, the helium atom, <laughs> which has two electrons, then they cannot be in the same quantum state. It's, it doesn't work like that. They have to be different states. Now, the quantum state of electrons is determined by the spin, up or down, the momentum, and the position in space. That's it. That's kind of cool. It's also quite a bit, I, I think it's insane that I, I don't get it, actually. So, we know that electrons has a unit charge. It's a negative charge. And then we have the proton, which is built up of quarks. I don't remember which quarks actually that build up the proton, but that's not the important part. The important part is somehow the positive charge of the proton and the negative charge of the electron are exactly opposite. Exactly. If there's a slight difference, if there was a slight difference, I mean, I don't know how many decimal points we're talking about, but I, I think it's quite a lot of decimal points. If there was a slight difference, then everything would fly apart. I mean, this mouse, hey, small mouse, it's made of trillions upon trillions of protons and electrons. But it has no charge. There's no net charge externally to this. It doesn't zap me, necessarily, when I touch it. I don't get how that's possible without there being a fundamental sort of connection between electrons and protons. Or, in this case, quarks. There has to be some underlying phenomenon that is the um, quantum electrodynamics or the, the weak force and strong force and the electromagnetic force there has to be some underlying magic there. I don't have the mathematical capability to understand string theory. Maybe it's Han, I don't know. Anyway, it's kind of cool. It's quite insane, I think, that the world is built like this. And it's weird. Because it, it, it's sort of a weird realization that at the deepest, smallest level, electrons, the world is weird. And it's actually governed by complex numbers. I find that amusing. Heisenberg found that disturbing. I think Dirac also. It's just disturbing that at the deepest fundamental level, the probability of finding an electron is a absolute value squared of a something called a uh, probability amplitude. Now this probability amplitude, or the wave function, is a complex number. So the probability is not complex, but the probability amplitude is complex. And that's just weird. So in order to compute is the electron at this point in space then I have to know this complex function, and that's complex function is some sort of um, just scalar times an exponential, which is e to the i, and e to a complex number will actually oscillate, so this is a standing wave. You have the k, which is, oh, what's that called again? It's something to do with the uh, momentum. Uh, the r, which is the position in space, 
we have the angular frequency and time. So this is kind of like a traveling wave. Now, in order to... Well, this is 100-year-old mathematics, but we cannot, when we talk about the quantum state of the electron, momentum and position in space and spin, we cannot actually, with ultimate position, determine both the position and the the uh, momentum, and that's limited by Planck's constant divided by two. This is actually uh, Planck's constant h bar, which is Planck's constant divided by two pi. I like the uh, interesting thing in 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 German, the uh, uncertainty principle, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, has actually changed name over the year. Right now, it's kind of called the unscharfe or Un, uh, sharp unsharpness principle and that's actually a better uh, word of it um, when we look at the wave function here this is very similar to what we see in electromagnetics where we have some sort of frequency and turns out some of the similar principles apply there is a mapping between what's called momentum space and real space. So we can think about this as similar to frequencies in time and frequencies in frequency space. So in the same manner that we could do, do a Fourier transform to go from voltage as a function of time into uh, frequency or amplitude and phase as a function of frequency we were through an FFT or an inverse FFT there is a similar way of thinking between momentum space and physical space they are two different representation of the same phenomena in momentum space if you are uncertain about the momentum then you can be certain about the position. It's kind of like with with um, with frequencies. If I know the frequency exact, then I cannot. Then I have to expand sort of time to the infinite. If we have a very short peak in the Fourier transform. That has to be a very long time series. And vice versa. If you have a Dirac in, in the time time dimension, it's actually uh, it has all frequencies in the frequency dimension. And the similar thing is here. So we cannot know both the position in space and the momentum at the same time. You can actually compute the size of an atom from this, uh, this link. Okay, so we have a quantum state. We know that fermions or electrons cannot be in the same quantum state in the same physical space. And using the Schrodinger equation, we can compute the time evolution of the quantum state. The wave function. So that's what this says. It says that there is some sort of derivative versus time of the wave function times some sort of Hamiltonian matrix. Now this is actually, let's call the, well, should, uh, Feynman called it the energy matrix, but it's, it's, it's a matrix of infinite dimensions that has the um, amplitudes for the change of the wave functions. So the tricky part that I sort of don't fully grasp yet, I think, is that <clears throat> when an electron changes quantum state, it, ha it has a certain probability of ending up in a different state. So let's say you have a silicon, two silicon atoms, and they're spaced right next to each other. Right? They actually have a certain probability of exchanging electrons. The electron on this side can jump to the other side and so on at a certain probability. That probability is determined by the Hamiltonian matrix, which may actually include um, derivatives also. 
But if you knew the Hamiltonian, then you can compute the energy levels and sort of yeah how this all works. But turns out that's pretty hard. We can do it for hydrogen, and I think it's it's uh, was it up to silicon or I don't remember which uh, atom we can actually compute it with the supercomputers. You can actually compute the, the um, Hamiltonian matrix and all the state transitions, but there is a limit. We cannot compute it for really big systems because it has so many dimensions. <laughs> At some point, it becomes infinite. But what we do know is that when we solve Schrodinger, which is basically a set of differential equations, then we get that the energy levels for an electron bound to an atom is discrete. So an electron can only exist in certain energy levels around the atom. So, yeah. And that's kind of cool. And something funny happens when you bring atoms close to each other. So what we're looking at here is the energy levels on, of, well, I don't know if it's actually the P and S orbitals. So just let's call them, yeah, let's call these energy levels. This is sort of discrete. When atoms are far away, we have the same energy levels for the two different atoms. An electron, not swerving around, but sort of existing around the nucleus of the um, atom, silicon atom, will have a certain energy level. And that energy level, energy level can be the same for the two electrons because they're not, they don't have the same state. So the spin can be the same, the momentum can be the same because the position in space is not the same. But as we bring silicon atoms closer together, then all these electron energy levels actually split. So instead of having just um, a single state in the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian becomes sort of two states. And we end up with two energy levels, one sort of plus a certain, man a certain number and minus a certain number. And it's the minus a certain number that's quite interesting because it's actually less energetic to be close to each other. So you can see it here. At a certain distance, the electrons can relax until... So the valence band is for the bound electrons, the ones that are part of covalent bonds, thus a valence band. So those are bound to bound to um, the atom. But th they can exist in lower energy state, on average, than free atoms. So that means that over time, stuff will coalesce. <laughs> Things will move together because it's less energy. And it actually takes energy to bring them apart. So, <clears throat> I mean, this is the fundament for all chemical reactions, this interplay between energy levels and bound states and free states. But what happens is that when we have a crystal lattice where you have many atoms, these sort of discrete energy gel levels around the atoms turn into bands on the, of allowed energy states. So electrons can exist in all these bands, which means that in a silicon lattice, the, the, um, the outermost electrons between the silicon atoms are shared and they will swap, uh, swap position. But it's not that important which electron is where because all electrons are identical. So what's important is that we know some sort of density of the states. How many states are in a certain uh, physical space and what energy levels are they at? Because it turns out what happens after a while in some materials is that there becomes a band gap, a gap between the bound electrons and what we call the, uh, the conduction band where the free electrons are. So these bands are sort of closely spaced. These are sort of what we call band diagrams. And the conduction band is given by the lowest energy state 
up here and then the valence band we sort of say is the highest energy state here but it's really a, a, a continuum of multiple closely spaced orbitals and these orbitals come directly from the Hamiltonian sort of the the possible quantum states of all the atoms in a certain space the silicon using itself looks like what you see here on the screen it has well, how many is it is it 14 yeah it's total that's uh, 18 atoms in total in the unit cell but if you actually repeated some of them would be duplicated and so on so you you can figure out how, <laughs> how many um, atoms there are in a certain cubic centimeter but anyway the lattice spacing so the distance from here to here is 0.543 nanometers roughly but this can, thing can be strained so if you put energy into the system so if you if you don't have if it's completely relaxed then 0.543 will be the distance but you can actually strain it a bit so that requires a bit of energy and that will happen naturally as you build a silicon a crystal lattice because sometimes an atom will be missing sometimes you put in a, a there might be cracks or anything like that so the lattice spacing will change a bit the nearest neighbor uh, I guess is the uh, I don't know yeah. yeah but this is the unit set now think about this how would the energy levels look like in this unit cell so we know that every single atom in here well they interact with every single other atom some of these uh, these pipes that you see here are the covalent bonds that's the two electrons that are shared between this atom and that atom but you can see that these two atoms they don't share anything neither does these two so the orientation of where I look in the unit cell the bonds are different which means that the quantum states must be different which means that the allowed energy levels the conduction band and the valence band must change as I change through change my location through the silicon lattice and that's indeed what happened <laughs> that's what happens um, that's called the band structure that's what you see on the right side here I have no idea how to read this uh, picture uh, but we can see that there's energy on the, the x oh, so on the y axis zero is going to be the top of the valence band I think so which means that I, I do think that uh, what we see up here is the sort of the start of the conduction band I'm not sure but I think that's how it works so that would mean that this stuff in between here is maybe the band gap I don't know if that's maybe it's a bit large because I think uh, for silicon it's about 1.12 volts so I might be wrong here I have no idea how to read this uh, image but I do know that for somebody that do know how to read the image what you're looking at here shows you the energy levels of I believe it's the orbitals of this three-dimensional structure somehow yeah I have no idea how this is quantum physics. Arsk is one of the quantum physics uh, professors. But the important part is that you realize that when we talk about conduction band and valence band and energy levels for those and distance between those, it is not a single number. And it actually also depends on, on, on direction. But we do simplify. So we say there's only two, and we say that the distance between the two bands, that's our band gap. Now, once we have the energy levels, we need some way of computing the probability of a... So energy levels, all these band structures, that gives you where it's possible for electrons to be. But the probability of there being an electron there and that's given by the Fermi Dirac statistics which is what you see here so 
uh, it's a function of the en energy levels and this gives you the probability of there being electrons so assuming that we have some imagined imagined level let's call it the fermi level that's its ef assuming that is there's a state there then that state would have a 50% probability of being occupied so if i plug in e here the energy level and uh, that's the same as the Fermi level, well, then this becomes zero, and I become one divided by two, so it's 50%. Now we can simplify this equation a bit. So we get uh, Fermi level minus the energy divided by KT, that's the same thing. That simplification doesn't work, though, when uh, the energy level is zero. Anyway, a couple of things to realize about this. Um, uh, Fermi direct statistics is that it just gives you the probability of the state being occupied but there needs to be a state there if there's not a state there then the probability of there being an electron there is zero another thing you should realize that th this this is where all those one over kt comes from <laughs> that you find in most equations it comes from the fermi direct statistics so the different type of materials that we get it's actually dependent on how the band splitting happens. So how do the energy levels of the individual atoms split when we bring them close to each other? For some, like metals, there's actually overlap between the conduction band and the valence band, so that there is no band gap. And that means there is a bunch of states, many states, bound states and free states, where you can have electrons, or indeed holes. So here, whether the conduction is, is mainly electrons or mainly holes, that depends on the material, but for metals it's often electrons, but it doesn't have to be. It can be a semi-metal where you actually have maybe uh, most of the conduction happens in the valence band. I didn't mention that, but in a material, if, let's go back here. In our silicon unit cell, if every single electron in that perfect crystal with no spaces, glitches, uniformities, no um, doping inaccuracies or whatever, assume there's nothing and that we have every single electron bound in a covalent bond. Also assume that we're close to zero temperature, or that we're actually at zero temperature. At that point, if every single electron is bound to an atom, and there's no vacancies anywhere, there cannot be current, because the charges, there is no free states. There's no states anywhere where you can jump to, and there's not enough energy at zero Kelvin to actually do something. Well, the probability is low. If every single electron is bound in a, la in a, a lattice, they cannot move. But introduce a single dopant atom to give you a single free electron or a, or a single hole in a valence band. So you maybe have one of these electrons, they, it is, has enough energy to um, move around freely in kind of vacuum. As soon as that happens, there is a there is a state, available state in the valence band. And if you have available states, then you can actually cause a drift or you can have a movement of charges. And if you have a movement of charges, you can have a current. But it's important to realize that currents can both happen by free electrons, moving sort of... Uh, similar to what they do in vacuum, moving through the lattice freely, or you can have movement in the valence band when there, where there are holes. There's empty states. That's important. So that also means that for some type of materials, like a P-type or N-pipe, so here we take a silicon and we introduce those dopant atoms. Um, let's see. It's usually boron phosphorus. And I don't remember which one has the extra electron. <laughs> Doesn't matter. I think it's... Um, yeah, I don't remember. 
you can look in the periodic table ele elements. But if you introduce an element that has a one electron less than silicon, then you'll have an extra hole. And what actually happens is that in an intrinsic silicon, which is sort of no um, impurities, the Fermi level will be in the middle. But as I introduce extra holes, the Fermi level shifts such that it is closer to the P, so the closer to the valence band. And the same thing happens for n-type, where I introduced extra electrons, or extra um, donor sites, acceptors, donors. Then the Fermi level moves closer to the conduction band. So that this actually gives you the ma majority and minority concentration of carriers. In an insulator, the distance between the band and the two bands is great, so it's really, really hard to excite an electron from the valence band up to the conduction band. And that's the reason why glass, for example, we can see through glass in the visible spectrum, but it's it's opaque for the ultraviolet, and you, from that you can actually compute the band gap if you wanted to. An interesting uh, phenomena. So the energy of a um, photon is given by Planck's constant times the frequency, HF. The light that we use in order to develop the 2 and 3 nanometer um, silicon chips is 13.5 nanometers. You can compute the frequency of that through the relation to, uh, well, between wavelength and, and light, uh, speed of light. And once you do that, and you figure out the electron volts, you will also discover that for 13.5 nanometer light, there is no material known in the universe that is transparent because there is no material that has a large that large band gap and that's kind of cool and it's also a bit unfortunate <laughs> because that means that the 13.5 nanometer light that is used in the extreme ultraviolet lithographic machines we cannot send it through a lens it's not possible so you have to reflect it you have to use mirrors for everything including the masks and it, which makes these uh, extreme ultraviolet machines Lethal machines, just mind-bogglingly expensive. I think to buy one is about $300 million. But it all comes back to the band gap <laughs> of insulators and the fact that you can't make lenses. So, band gap in silicon is lower though. 1.2 uh, 1 electron volts. And the interesting ha thing happens when you, you put the type of uh, different semiconductors next to each other. So one doped with boron, one doped with uh, phosphorus, for example. You put them next to each other. And since we mentioned the, sh the Fermi levels, they had shifted. But actually, when you put things in contact, well, you can't have a difference in Fermi level over time. So a difference in Fermi level is what you have on a battery. On one side, the Fermi level is high. On the other side, the Fermi level is low. And a difference in Fermi level is pretty much the same as a difference in energy or a difference in voltage. And if you have a difference in Fermi level anywhere inside a conductor, there will be a current. So that means that if I bring two materials together, so if you were here, let's go back here, these two, right, they have the Fermi level here and the Fermi level there. So if I bring them next to each other, they have to align somehow. So there needs to be some sort of bend. Because, because the, the conduction band and valence band, that's sort of in the same position almost. <laughs> so that's what we're seeing here. Here I brought the uh, p-type and n-type together and the Fermi level aligns over time. It doesn't happen instantaneously but it happens over time, and it actually happens continuously that the Fermi level aligns. So there will be a certain movement of electrons 
from the n-type side over to the p-type side. And the movement holds from p-type side over to the n-type side. And those will be locked into place, so bound to um, dopant sites. And that creates a potential, a voltage difference across this, what's called a depletion region. So on one side, there's a negative potential, and the other side is a positive potential. So there's a voltage across here, uh, which is called uh, the built-in voltage. And this is the origin of diodes, because it turns out this type of structure, it only conducts current in one direction. It's only if you raise the voltage on the P side, you can keep the voltage the same on the N side. If I raise the voltage on the P side, then I can get a current to flow through here. So there's an excess of electrons that flow, uh, excess of um, holes that flow through. Now, actually what happens is that the, the uh, built-in voltage reduces when I raise the voltage here. We'll get back to that. So, <clears throat> if there are quantum states, then Fermi direct statistics tells you the probability of there being electrons there. So in order to compute the density of holes and electrons, I have to integrate. So I need to know the density of states, or the density of uh, states as a function of energy levels, and then I need to multiply that by the Fermi Dirac uh, statistics and integrate over the full conduction band in order to get the number of electrons in the conduction band. Now, if I assume that the Fermi level is independent of temperature, I think it is, I'm not sure, but I think it is, then I can actually pull that out, so we get e, uh, EF divided by KT, and then we have an integral here. And in order to compute this, I need to know the density of states as a function of energy. But we can see that sort of a Fermi level divided by KT, that happens uh, all the time in equations. So, yeah, that's why we have this KT all over the place. Fields. Oh, this is getting into the weeds. So, we have this thing called electric field and magnetic field. Actually, to be very specific, there is only the electric field. And the magnetic field is a rel relativistic effect of the, the electric field. But we have equations that relate these to each other. This is the first one electric flux to net enclosed electric charge. What does this mean? Huh? So the <clears throat> I'm going to try and explain it, but be aware, I'm not an expert in these kind of things. But the way I choose to think about it is just look at the equation. So on the Let's see, it's the right side. We have a volume integral. Now, rho in this case, that's the charge density. So, if I draw some sort of uh, volume, and that volume has a certain charge density, so a certain number of charges, and if I integrate the charge density over that complete volume, and then I look at a surface. Actually, uh, I'm pretty bad at drawing uh, circles. Or Imagine that this is a circular volume. And that I was looking at the surface of this one. So the electric field that comes through the surface. This is the E field. If I look at the electric field of whatever comes through the surface of this volume, well, it's given by the volume integral of all the charges inside. So let, let's actually look at that. So let's say, for example, I have one electron and I have one proton. P plus, that's uh, probably bad for a proton, but it doesn't matter, you understand what I mean. Oh wow, that turned funky. Okay, 
It's a bit of a lag here. There we go. Yeah, one electron and one proton inside. Well, if I have two charges, one's positive, one's negative, then my charge density, oh, now it seems a bit funky in my iPad here. I'm gonna skip that. <clears throat> then the charge density enclosed is zero. So there's no electric field. But if there's more electrons, then there is electric field or more positrons, which is kind of what I talked about with this mouse, right? The fact that this is no external electric field is f weird to me. Anyway, that's what this equation says. This is one of the first uh, Maxwell equations. We have another one. <clears throat> Let's see what that is. Okay, yeah. So the magnetic flux, so the, the, uh, through this volumetric surface in space, that's this uh, circuit in circle integral over a surface, sort of the magnetic flux through that surface is zero. What does that mean? Well, it, it basically means that there is no such thing as magnetic charge. And this should be obvious because there's no such thing as a magnetic field, kind of. It's not a thing on its own. It, it, uh, it is only related to the relativistic effects of the electric field. So a changing electric field will give rise to a magnetic field. But you can't have a magnetic field on its own. Okay. Now we're talking slightly differently here. Um, I guess it, it's kind of similar to, um, is it cursive voltage law, it's called? So what the left side here says is, take the electric field and any electric field and draw a circle, a certain surface, not a surface as in a volume, but a circle, a loop. Now, the integral of the electric field around that loop is going to be given by minus the change in the net magnetic flux through a surface, uh, through that same surface, I guess, somehow. So, what, what does this tell you? Um, if you know the magnetic flux, you can integrate that, you can uh, look at the change as a function of time, and that tells you something about the electric field. And then it's also similar for the magnetic flux, that the, the magnetic field, or if you're looking at loops here, then this is similar to what we used to talk about with, uh, what's it called, the the, um, <laughs> the right-hand rule and, and sort of the current in uh, wires and so on and the direction of the electric field. I, I guess we used to sit like this somehow because they're orthogonal vectors. So it relates the um, the magnetic field around some sort of loop through the current density through a surface and the changing electric field through a surface. And all these things are the Maxwell equations. I've, I, I don't think I've ever used them other than trying to understand sort of the principles. But I, I know people who have. Anyway, these uh, equations include some constants. So both the permittivity of free space, that's actually defined as uh, the one over the permeability times the uh, <coughs> speed of light squared. And the permeability is defined from the fine structure constants, Planck's constant, the charge of the electron, and speed of light. Now, voltage. Voltage is actually let's let's go back to the first slide here. Sorry for jumping a bit back and forth, but I've already forgotten. So. Voltage, where's voltage? Voltage is watt divided by amps. Watt is Joule divided by seconds. Joule is Newton meter. So Newton meter seconds divided by amps is volts. Newton meter divided by seconds divided by amps. 
So it's some sort of force <laughs> times some sort of distance times some sort of time. And I guess ampere is already time, so it's more charge. So voltage gives you some sort of idea of a force. <clears throat> or a potential force, I would say. And I think that's what we see here. So the strength of this force is sort of at the electric field. And that's vaulted, the, the, the uh, derivative of voltage as a function of space. Yeah. Volt per meter. Current, we've talked about that already, but quite often we, we talk about current density. So imagine that you have a point in space and you actually know the, call it the velocity vector, of the current in that space. And then if you know the velocity vector and you have the surface that it's going through, then you can multiply by the area and you get the current. <clears throat> now, turns out there are two different types of, types of current. The first one is what we call drift current. This is related to a force. So we know from Newton that force equals mass times acceleration. That is slightly different for electric charges, but it's really <clears throat> that um, if we ignore the magnetic field though, that we get the force on a particle is given by the electric field strength times a charge. And this, this is actually a, a voltage. So a potential force is the same as a voltage. So to get the current density, how fast or how, mm, yeah. Uh, let's get the unit of current density later, but we have a force on particles. The N here is the density, how many are there? And the mu is the mobility, how easily do they move? So this gives you some sort of speed vector in space. The speed of, of, uh, charges. How many other, or maybe it's more like momentum actually, because there's many. I, I think it's more like momentum. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because how many are there? That well, Mobility, that's a speed. So a force times a certain speed, or maybe it's an acceleration, that gives you the current. But uh, if you then multiply by uh, how many are there, the density, then that should be some sort of momentum. I think that's right. <laughs> so if we have uh, the electric field is volt per meter, we can actually write out the units. And then we see that um, the current density is a so coulomb per second times a meter minus squared. So this is where we multiply by the area to get the current. So it's a movement of a certain charge per second. Yeah. Okay, so let's multiply by an area. So an area has a certain, and this is just a unit. Then we get the current. So we have, we have the charge, electron, electric charge. We have the number the density of charges, we have the mobility, and we have a certain area, and we have the voltage. Now we can see that this is a conductance. So I equals a conductance times a voltage. So this is our conductance, and we can then immerse it to get the uh, resistance. And here we have Ohm's law. Hey, <laughs> cool. Okay, and then there's a second one. And, and this bothered me for many years. I didn't get it. So we have this equation for something called a diffusion current. And somehow that's different from drift current. And the current density for diffusion current is given by some sort of, oh, oh it's the <laughs> electric charge, times some sort of diffusion constant, times the derivative of the charge density as a function of space. I remember in the beginning, I was sort of thinking about this as a bucket of water. If you dump a bucket of water somewhere, then the charges will 
that, that the water will flow out, right? But that's actually not the correct way to think about it, I think. Because it's quantum electro it's it's quantum electrodynamics. It actually comes directly from Schrodinger. So what you're looking at now is the Schrodinger equation in one div dimension for a free moving electron. So we have one sort of wave function for the electron. It's a position it's a function of position and time. On the right side here we have the energy operator. This sort of operates on the wave functions and, and gives you the energy. On the left side, we have the potential. This is the force on that wave function. And then we have, this is the momentum. It might not be obvious, but this is the momentum. This is momentum operator on the wave function. So this gives you, actually, uh, it's similar to the classical uh, equation for energy. So I think we can do, is it E equals, uh, we have potential energy plus kinetic energy, right? Well, that's going to be half mv squared. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> We have some sort of potential given by height, and then there's some sort of uh, kinetic energy. And what you're looking at is the same thing, because, uh, let's see, if we have the momentum, P, that's mv, and if we were to put that into here, wow. I have to, well, I have to square this P, so P squared, and I have to multiply by 1 over M, 1 over 2, so then I get an half MV squared, right? So that's what you're looking at, at here, up here. So you have the second derivative of the wave function, that's the second derivative of the momentum, or this becomes the momentum. And then you have divided by 2m, so this is the mass, and that corresponds to this part. And then, of course, the half, and then you have the h bar. That's there for some reason. <laughs> so, the Schrodinger equation you're looking at now gives you the time evolution of the electron. Even if we set the voltage here to zero, so there's no field on the electron. The position of the electron, which is given by the absolute value squared of the wave function, will still evolve. It can still move, because it has some uh, momentum. The momentum is given by the energy. So it's still going to move around. And if you have multiple electrons in different positions, you have the Hamiltonian giving the probability for them exchanging places. And on average, if you have more electrons in one part, or more uh, electrons in one part, and you have available states in another part of the uh, material, there will be a drift of electrons. So the drift current, sorry, the, sorry, the diffusion current, <laughs> there will be a diffusion of uh, electrons. So the diffusion current and the drift current are two aspects of the Schrodinger equation. It's just there. It's how the world works. And you can't do anything about it. It just is. So there are two different types of currents. And that's just... It took me way, way too long to realize that it's actually related to the Schrodinger equation. And it is just is. There's no point in sort of arguing about there's two different aspects of uh, blah, blah, blah. It's, it just is two different things. Diffusion and drift. So but that means when, when we talk about current in a material, we actually have to account both of them. So we have to... <clears throat> 
count the uh, electron drift, we have to count the uh, electron diffusion, and we have to count the whole drift and the whole diffusions. Now, some of these might not matter. Maybe in a metal, it's really only the end drift that matters. Because maybe the charge density in a metal is pretty much the same everywhere. In other places well, where the um, where the electrons move slower, maybe it matters. So yeah. Anyway, resistors. Well, it's basically what we saw before. It is a material where the mobility or the ability of m movement of charges is limited. The speed, basically, or the acceleration. Acceleration, I think, is more correct. And the type of carrier will be different. So uh, we have whatever is dominating the current in a system, we will call the majority carrier, and whatever is not dominating, we'll call the minority carriers. But both of them are very important in semiconductors. Capacitors, this we talked about earlier, it is current is given by the capacitance as a times the deriv derivative of voltage as a function of time. And this kind of means that it resists a change in voltage. Similar for an inductors, it's just opposite. It resists a change in current. It cannot change currents instantan instantaneously. Which is why you can get sparks when you turn something off. This is why. This exact equation is why when you pull your socket out of the... Um, outlet, you can sometimes get a spark. Because let's assume that there is a current flowing through the socket, and you pull it out. At that point in time, you're changing the current instantaneously. Now your wire will have a certain inductance, and that inductance does not like the current to change fast. It's given by the equation, so the voltage will change very fast. And you can get enough voltage, so kilovolts, across the uh, from the socket to the plug, and you can actually see a spark gap. Um, this is quite important when you have a lot of current flowing in uh, superconductors, like uh, magnetic resonance in imaging machines where you have a lot of current flowing around to so generate a very strong man magnetic field, you cannot turn off that current instantaneously. It's also what happens in, happened in the Large Hadron Collider, where some of the uh, superconducting wires lost their superconductivity, and then the whole thing just poof, blew up. Okay, that's what I wanted to touch on on the refresher. Uh, we haven't gotten into diodes or transistors. We'll do that later.